Greetings friends, and welcome to this edition of Tales from the Tabletop, the video series where I scour the internet my own personal experience to bring you anecdotes of adventure, and I take my favorite one and illustrate it for your listening and viewing pleasure. Thanks so much for joining me, let's begin. Our first story comes from Moondrake. Moondrake writes, My credit card company calls me every time I make a purchase from Pro Fantasy because it's an overseas transaction. I always tell them that it is a valid transaction. For the uninitiated, I looked it up, profantasy.com is uh, a website that sells map making uh, software and you can also get your own maps made there as well. Uh, and it's uh, for, for folks who play role playing games, surprise. However, for uh, those of you who English is not your first language, profantasy rhymes with the word profanity, which means like a, a foul or rude language. So uh, if you're not familiar with Profantasy, the name sounds like it might be a, a fun, naughty store that sells fun, naughty things. One time, the bank called and it was a little old lady on the other end. She said, we have an overseas transaction on your card, and then whispered, it's from a site called Pro Fantasy. With a big smile on my face, I told her, oh yes, please accept those charges. Sometime later, I was working on a major campaign, doing lots of maps during the evening from my home office. This took months. At the end of it, I made the floor plan to my house in DD3, and it looked really good. So, I showed it to my wife. She has never seen any Pro Fantasy products and asked me how I did it. I explained it to her and told her that's what I had been doing these past months. A look of utter relief came over her face and I watched a tension I had not noticed she was carrying as it melted away. She sheepishly admitted to me that she had seen the charges to the store, Pro Fantasy, and thought I was having some sort of online affair all this time. <laughs> that poor woman. Oh my word, I cannot imagine how how harrowing that time must have been. I tell you what, y'all, this is why clear communication uh, uh, from personal experience in my own marriage, uh, as soon as something feels a bit off, bring it up. Bring it up right away. And it's cool because as soon as it feels off, it's not, uh, the tension hasn't built, so it's not weird. So it's, hey, I feel off. Can we talk? Let's talk. Let's get it out early. The longer you let it go, the worse it gets and the bigger of a rift it can create. But nobody came here for marriage advice, so... I digress. This next story is uh, one of the touching moments that I alluded to earlier. This comes from West Consequence 6078, and it is titled The Fight That Made My Party Cry. So I've been in this campaign for a while. I'm playing a jester-like bard character with a bit of a goofy, carefree idiot personality. The party is going after the big bad, which is this massive outer planar entity of unknown origin. Outside of the game, I am sadly moving away, and I won't be able to play with this group anymore. So without the other players knowing, I asked the DM if it would be possible to have this fight be my final goodbye with my character. We planned out how some small things would go, nothing major, but I basically knew this fight was meant to teach us that we weren't ready. So I had a plan for this goodbye, and my DM gave me a magical item a few sessions back that lets me cast Banishment as a free action. The day of the fight, the other players go in incredibly cocky, only for our cleric to go down almost all the way. After a few rounds, I looked at the DM and told my party, I don't think we can actually beat this thing, so let's get out. Being in a different plane, I knew that banishment would send us to the material plane, but it was only enough to cast on five people, and there are six of us. I told everyone to willingly fail the save without telling them anything else. They all knew how dire the fight was going, and all accepted. 
I banished all five of them with a big performance. My character was jumping around joyfully and smiling like he was an idiot trying to entertain a crowd before saying, This is the best performance of my life, so don't let anyone forget it! Before they disappeared, they could hear my character's laughter. I knew that I needed to keep concentrating on the spell, so I casted Sanctuary from a magical item we were given previously. The entire time they were there, they were fully aware of their missing member until a minute had passed, and they couldn't find or hear him anywhere. There was a long pause before one of them yelled at me, asking what the hell I did and where was I, to which I responded, A great performer always leaves you wanting more. I sadly moved away a few days ago, and the DM just told me that they had a statue erected in his hometown with a plaque that says, For the most foolish fool in all the world, you are missed. That's sweet. I love that. I know you didn't come here for marriage advice, and I know you don't come here for life advice, but something that these games have taught me and teach all of us, the shared experiences of joy and love are real, and it's in all of our best interest to never miss an opportunity to have fun with our friends and to show our love, and these games give us new ways and new opportunities to do exactly that. And I love this story because we've got a player and a group of, uh, a group of friends who understood this and uh, did exactly what all of us should be doing. That's just lovely. The next story comes from Lionheart X042. My favorite story comes from a D&D 3.5 campaign that I was taking part in. I was playing an absolutely ridiculous monk. Somewhere along the way, I picked up a feat that allowed me to speak any language. I don't know why I took it. I think I was half awake when I was creating the character. Anyways, as we were going through the adventure, there was a gelatinous cube that was wandering through an area that we had come into. In my infinite wisdom, I looked at the party and yelled out, Wait! I can speak cube! And my monk ran over to the cube and proceeded to say, Blur, 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 blur. The party was laughing so hard after that, we had to pause because Mountain Dew shot out of multiple noses. Ah, classic. Our next story comes from username Flock with 4Ks, and it is titled, The Guy Who Thinks That Everything Sucks. I was hosting a group of strangers, and they were in the process of creating their characters. One guy decided to be a cultist, since the only means of gaining magic in this world is to sell your soul to a higher being and gain their favor and affinity through your actions. In exchange, they reward you with power. The cult that he was born into was decided randomly through means of dice. His first patron was the Void Core. Its aspects of dominion are void, madness, nothingness, and sacrifices. It gives you the power to delete things on a fundamental level and bring forth the unknowable force of the void. The player turned to me and said, GM, this sucks. Void is useless. What? I, uh, okay, uh... I'll allow you to re-roll then. I, I want you to have fun. His second patron was the Warden. Its aspects of dominion are time, space, laws, and physics. It is a being of pure order that upholds the natural laws of the universe and does not take kindly to things that attempt to warp them. It gives you the powers of space-time manipulation, but punishes you severely if you use them to cause chaos. The player says to me, What space? Uh, you know, like, matter? The the very fabric of reality? Space is weak. The warden sucks. What else you got? I suggest that he pick some other origin instead. He agrees and decides to be born as an engineer. What does this do? Well, you can make contraptions and invent things. Get creative. 
Can I make an army of robots? Uh, yeah, but you'll need a lot of material and resources to do that. You'll need to obtain unique upgrades for your robots. GM, why do you want me to fail? The other players were complaining that he is too whiny and is asking too many questions instead of just playing the game. He ended up ruining everyone's motivation to play. No kidding. Oh my word. So the teachable moment, friends, the lesson to learn from here, you can't please everybody all the time and some people you can't please at all. I mean, I think it in in a game that is uh, either D&D or D&D like you have the power of void you can send somebody into nothing that's huge because in in D&D and similar games usually when you're dead you just kind of like drop into a non-material plane and you could be brought back or resurrected or people can go into the plane or yada 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 but no 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 i have the power of void you are undone there's no coming back. That is hugely powerful. This freaking... Bringing someone with no imagination to a, a game of high imagination is like bringing a knife to a gunfight. It just, it don't work. And that's a rough time and I hate it for everybody and just dag on. I hate to be the guy who says this, but for some problem players, there is no cure. It's just time for you to go. Sorry, this isn't for you. Our next story comes from Hazardous Jester, and he answers the question, what is the most metal moment in a campaign that you have ever played? I went with the dragon in a town where we were making a political power play, and we started a fight with some guards. The dragon landed, and the guards began to flank him. I summoned desecrated ground under them that had several skeleton arms that popped out of the ground and grabbed their legs. I then had the dragon breathe. He has force breath, not elemental. And the combination shattered the legs of the guards as the bodies flew everywhere while the arms of the dead held them in place. Some of the bodies flew off dismembering their legs and hit wounded fleeing guards like flesh cannonballs that killed them as well. That's metal as hell. On another occasion, this is from the same user, and this is the one that I've been illustrating the whole time. Uh, Hazardous Jester writes, We also have this NPC who traveled with us, so we could make a foothold for money in a new town. He's a bit older and not really strong-willed. We moved into a shop after killing the shop owner by a brutal decapitation. This caused the NPC to faint. As we were beginning our plans for this city, we needed to put the NPC to sleep, so I thought I'd scare him into blacking out again. I took the old innkeep's severed head and tried to reanimate it. I used the innkeep's soul that we had collected, but I stored it in a vial that had multiple spiders in it as well. Because of course, people just carry around vials of spiders everywhere, they, what? I botched the roll, I botched it so hard that a new head grew on the decapitated body of the innkeep in the form of a giant spider head. A giant spider head that called itself Legion because all of the other spider's consciousnesses were inside of it. This spider-headed innkeep became my familiar. Of course I had to draw that one. I have to draw that one. Creepy spider head on an innkeep. That's just, that's, come on, that's the most metal thing ever. Also, it's funny. And also, I love drawing creepy, funny things in black and white. My kid says that uh, it's obvious I'm having the most fun at the drawing board when I create images that are spooky cute. And uh, I don't know if that necessarily describes my style, but uh, I 100% had a blast drawing this one. Now, if you like this image as well, it'll be available on my store on my website at coffeeandhate.biz. Click store at the top. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for listening. And may your dice roll high and never be cursed.